Hello everyone and welcome to today's Talks at Google event. I am JT and I have the privilege of hosting today's event in conversation with Laura Dockerell, the author of the brilliant book, What Have I Done? It's a heartbreaking and uplifting memoir about resilience, love, and finding your way to the other side of maternal mental health illnesses. This event has been arranged in honor and in response to the tragic loss of a fellow Googler, Caitlin O'Keefe, at the start of this year, who was suffering from severe postnatal illnesses. And just before I introduce Laura, a heads up that we will save time for any questions or comments you may have. So please feel free to use the YouTube live feature uh, at any time and we'll review and run through the questions near the end of the time that we have with Laura. As a quick intro to Laura before I do introduce Laura, um, Laura is a award-winning author and illustrator. So whilst What Have I Done uh, is Laura's first book for adults, she has written 13 books for children and young adults. And we'll hear more about the book, What Have I Done, um, shortly. But before we do that, a quick summary for those who are yet to read the book. Um, as many as eight out of 10 new mums struggle in the weeks after birth. So Laura had never experienced mental health illnesses before and was reassured by family, friends, and professionals that she was feeling, what she was feeling was normal. But in Laura's case, these feelings escalated scarily quickly into postpartum psychosis, a rare and debilitating illness. Within a matter of days, Laura became paranoid, delusional, and suicidal. And when her baby was just three weeks, and on Mother's Day, Laura was institutionalized without her baby. Throughout this time, she was haunted by the sense of, what have I done? Despite this grueling experience, Laura's story is a hopeful one. Uh, she has come out the other side stronger and more assured. Um, now she's determined to break the stigma around post uh, postnatal mental health shatter the romanticized expectations of perfect motherhood and to empower parents that you are not alone. Just before introducing Laura, two really kind of um, uh, important quotes from the book. Uh, one is from Adele, the superstar singer and mother. She says, a book to save a whole generation of women. Um, and Mia Vaughan says, this book will save lives. Laura is completely honest about her experiences and shows incredible insight into her thoughts and feelings at a time. It is a must read for everybody. So Laura, welcome. Hi, JT. Um, firstly, thank you so much for joining today. And how are you? I'm really good. I'm so, I'm so honored to be a part of this and just so proud that um, we're here doing this. I think it's gonna be, yeah, raise lots of awareness and bridge that gap between mental health and parenthood that so badly needs to happen. Yeah, and you know, we, we've been quite conscious about doing this now. It's the beginning of Mental Health Week. Last week was um, Maternal Mental Health Week and Maternal uh, Mental Health Awareness Day was on the 5th also. So, you know, really kind of ensuring that we're having this conversation when there is that awareness. Um, in preparation for today, there was a couple of funny things that I kind of noticed. The first was so your birthday is the same day as my wife. So it's, it's coming up. So happy birthday in advance for that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and then Gemini. The is, yeah. And then the second is Jet, your son, is is um, three years old, as is my son, Teddy. So they were bo born at the beginning of 2020. So uh, the three major life, this phase I'd never heard of is, uh, is seriously kind of real, a bit more of the sass and um answering back then i yeah, i uh, total, expected uh, total free nagers aren't they exactly. but you can really i guess when you could really plant yourself in that world really when books are already you know teetering on relatable i think when you can already have those immediate facts that align up with yours because there was a really wild storm i remember in that first year which did not add uh, to my illness um which was just out of the blue it was like the coldest spring ever so you must have gone through that in those early days too yeah yeah it was definitely the same sort of kind of hibernation as we're experiencing at the moment yeah totally um, so um you you're you've just launched the paperback version of your book so I, i've got the hardback version so what have i done um how's the the launch of the paperback going at the moment? <laughs> Well, I just wasn't expecting to still be in this scenario. I thought when the hardback came out, I mean, I mean, I was gutted when because this was almost a year ago when the book came out the first time. I, I really felt this sense of wanting to, you know, I'd outed the bully. I'd sort of ripped the, the killer's the mask off the killer's face, you know, and I was like, here, you know, this is an illness that can happen. And we booked the London Palladium to launch at. I actually, with Adele was going to interview me on stage, and I'd really geared myself up for that, going on Broadway to talk about postpartum psychosis, that kind of thing. And then all of that got shut down. And 
it, it felt quite sad at first because I was like, oh, oh, you know, it takes a lot of courage to get to that point where you are ready to out yourself out about these big themes and, and walk alongside mental illness in that way. But actually, in retrospect, you know, looking back, I'm like, this is the best place for me to be. I did not think that the second time around when the paper book was out, paperback was out, that we'd be in the same scenario. But, you know, some of the messages I get from women are so overwhelming, you know, that they've been very courageous to sharing with me that, it's precious cargo, you know, and I think being at home with my home comforts, this is where I should be. Yeah, um, good on you. And uh, uh, from reading your book and uh, Mia's words, her quote in particular, that final sentence around, you know, this is a must book read for everybody um, is really important. That must read for everybody about the fact that it's not just the the mum's experiences, but their kind of support network. Um, and certainly for me personally, I definitely wish I had read and then reread your book kind of before the birth of, of both um, my son. So um, just as a kind of background um, for the audience to kind of get a better understanding of you, could you share a bit of your background, both kind of personal and professional to, you know, whatever you're comfortable to share? Sure. So I've never, well, first of all, I've never had any experience with poor mental health. So when this experience happened, you know, I just thought naively, not in a mean way, but I just thought I was lucky I was not somebody that had to deal with that. You know, that's partly, I think, because of school, you know, it's never brought up, it's never taught in school that you might have to ever um, come face to face with such an illness. So I didn't have the tools to understand it, the language to describe it. Um, came from a pretty chaotic loving family you know all my family my all of them my parents were hot footing you know one job to the next we had times when we were okay times when we were a bit more wobbly we were all right uh brother and sister um just loads of fun and colorful felt very supported and loved and my family really came through when i was unwell um and hugo my partner so we were best friends when we were kids 14 years old we met in south london um secretly we were like such best friends secretly fancying each other the entire time and it uh almost had a kind of will they won't they for about 10 years and went off in our own directions and then got together again about four years ago uh got pregnant super quick and then um was hit yeah with this illness which has completely changed both of our lives and i, I don't know if i didn't have we didn't have all that wealth of experience together that trust that we had if we weren't build, built upon that foundation I just don't know if we would have survived what we have done because it took an enormous amount of trust you know I really a lot of my conspiracies and delusions were pointed in his direction so it was really amazing that we had that history and um and Hugo is now um your husband right it's not uh your boyfriend oh. so congrats on that that was oh, earlier this thank year you. Yeah, we got married on Jet's second birthday, just before the world ended. Um, we had a massive party and it was, it it felt more than just the kind of celebration um, of our wedding, you know, it was Jet's birthday, but also we had made it. And I, I had planned a little party actually, when I was well for about a year, a kind of off medicate, a kind of postpartum party. Um, and it was just too soon, you know, the pressure of that, I was like, I was lying to myself, you know, recovery is not linear, it takes a long time, you know, and it's ups and downs. So that was like a real, okay, I feel ready now. I can't believe in these three years survived a psycho psychotic episode out of pandemic is pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, that is um, quite I'm married, I'm a sphere of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, just kind of moving on to uh, your pregnancy. So in your book, you talk about the fact that your pregnancy was actually quite a, um, an ideal experience, right? Um, so could, could you share a bit more about that and also the kind of maybe misconception people looking in at that experience thinking, right, if the pregnancy was that great, you know, the assumption is post-birth is also going to be that great. Totally. Well, um, I think, to be honest, JT, I just didn't feel like a fraud. Like so much in my life, I feel like, you know, when you're um, a freelance, because I, I write books for my job, that's what I usually do in children's books. Um, and when you write freelance, I always feel a little bit like, oh, I haven't got enough, you know, I'm not academic enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not this enough, I'm not a businesswoman enough, all of this. So when I was pregnant, I felt like a sort of, like I had a ring, like a satin like ring around me of protection. I felt like, no, I'm doing the main thing now. I can't get a cold, friends can't fall out with me the tax man can't come get me you can't find me on a train for not having a ticket I'm pregnant sort of thing I really enjoyed and I wasn't scared of things anymore like I not I don't mean this in a delusional way or a romanticized way but 
like in the night time I didn't mind you know watching tv at 2 a.m because I couldn't sleep because I was uncomfortable in the bed you know I'd enjoy it and have a bagel on the sofa and I, I felt good I felt not overly prepared or not under prepared I just felt like I was in tune with myself I didn't kind of make that passport to anxiety birthing plan too intensely and um was prepared uh, prepared to be unprepared basically um and then I got became two weeks overdue um and so went to the hospital to be induced and then that's when things started to go wrong yeah yeah and um I think particularly that part of the the book um you know you're, you're very brave to kind of share the details of that experience it to to a certain degree, it was quite similar to the experience my wife felt we um, went through with our first birth. So again, you know, massive kudos to you for having the the um, strength to kind of share that part of your story. Um, you can't you, you've you've mentioned not in the book but elsewhere just the maybe the frustrations that you had with the support you were getting in in the hospital in terms of multiple midwives and multiple kind of advice. Can you kind of go into that in a bit more detail, please? Sure. Um, well, I'm a girl's girl. My like women friends are so important in my life and I'm I'm very, very close with my sister. And I was quite looking forward to the physical experience as well. Obviously not the family tearing and all of that, but I was looking forward to giving birth um, and and surprising myself in a good way. And But I was also really looking forward to having that like cheerleader experience. And I think again, this is because I've probably watched too many movies, but I really wanted that woman to be next to me being like, you can do it, you can do it sort of thing. And um, I just remember trying to, there wasn't anybody, you know, the turnovers were just so quick. It was midwife after midwife after midwife. I, I mean, we're writing the script adaptation at the moment. And um, even the one of the, uh, the people from the company was like this is just too many midwives it's not even believable I was like this isn't even half of the reality and you know this is not me bringing down at all the NHS I think especially in the last year they've been absolutely amazing but um of course for them what is this biggest day for you is potentially for them just another day at the office and that's there's good things to that too you know I like to see a kind of nonchalant uh midwife the same way I would want to see a nonchalant air stewardess during turbulence you know you don't want to see them panicking but um yeah I did feel kind of lack of that one-on-one -on -one connection and support so when things started to get to panic stations and get really out of control I didn't really feel like I had that one person that was across everything uh, but people are people and I like to think everybody's just doing their best and not having anger towards the situation has helped me so much in my recovery so I'm grateful for that but uh, it was just very quickly you are kind of you know you're moved from one room to the next and your whole team will change and there's panic stations or your notes get lost and um, things that potentially could have been spotted during my pregnancy uh, like my placenta failing which could have potentially have stopped it getting as bad as it did. Yeah um, and just into I think you know that's a really important point about uh, misconceptions and and assumptions in terms of that experience you have a few um i think i called it like interludes in between your chapters uh that are really kind of critical myth busters so one is called things that may happen to you after you give birth that nobody tells you about and then there's a couple others one is like stuff that you were scared of before you gave birth and stuff that scared are you, you. talking about my little m m skits yeah yeah like, they're, they're brilliant and um, you know like i say because i i kind of I listened to your audio book. I was kind of hearing you telling me basically these myths. Um, so I yeah, can you share more? Well, unfortunately. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> maybe for the film. But um, could you share uh, more on this and why you included these in, in your book? I, I think they're really powerful. But um, yeah, if you could just expand on that in a bit more detail, please. Thank you. I sometimes I don't know if they're powerful because I think with this book, I, I, I mean. <laughs> This book, I really didn't, very nearly didn't write it. You know, I was so scared of it. I I wrote this blog when Jet was six months old, purely because I felt like I had to. I was so scared to write this down. I was completely still in a chokehold, gripped by fear of everything. I was still traumatized. I was on a lot of medication. Um, I did not feel like myself. Plus, on top of all of that, I had a newborn to care for. Um, I, feel like I, I felt like I'd kind of been in a shipwreck and I was at the island where I needed to be, but I just couldn't get over the storm that we'd witnessed and everything was there, but I just didn't feel like the same person. And um, 
it's funny, isn't it? Because I think my whole life I'd written and of course the one thing that actually I needed to do to process it all probably was write. Um, but it just didn't feel like it. I felt like almost like if I wrote it down on my computer, it would infect my computer and get into the system. And then it would it, it like some sort of toxic oil, like the trauma. And um, so this book came about because I wrote it all on my phone, really, 275,000 words, which is ridiculous. And nobody wants to read that. It's now about 80,000 words. So these little things were um, I had jet sleeping across me and sometimes I was just like this is exactly what I, I was thinking all the time about the person that might read this book which was a person that maybe you know the worst case on the, you know where I was suicidal and isolated and had love and support around them maybe even but just couldn't access themselves or that help um, and so they're just shorthand like even if you only manage to read those bits in this whole book um, you're not the only person that's going through that and you're not weird or broken or a failure, um, you know, for, or a bad person or any of those things for thinking those bad things, those things. Yeah, and uh, such a good point. I think reading someone else basically kind of essentially admitting to those kind of feelings normalises it a bit more. So a couple of the examples being, and there's quite a spectrum to, uh, to them. So you talk about crying like you've never cried before, um, struggling to breastfeed and then you know might not instantly love your baby so yeah, as I say it's quite a, a strong um, spectrum of, of feelings but through reading that you know I, I can only imagine it will reassure others that the way they feel isn't isn't kind of unique um, and then uh, there's humor to to some of this as well so that the contrast between you know what scared you before you gave birth um, to the stuff that scared you after you had jet uh, more so in the kind of Foremost, you talk about you know being afraid of ghosts and Streatham, the, uh, the town in, in London, um, and then uh, yeah, again reading it and, and being a dad, it really helped me kind of understand how m mothers kind of feel and and that kind of contrast and how quickly feelings can change. So examples of how you what you were scared of after having Jet is being a bad mom and uh, being sectioned and losing your mind and you know. Um, meeting your unwell self so it, it's it goes from light-hearted to, to serious but i think it needs to do that so w was that kind of intentional to, to really hammer home the point uh just honest i think you know listening is so important we're always taught to listen oh i don't listen enough just listen but actually for me what's been the most helpful is people going yeah me too you know i felt as bad as that and i'm okay now and i was desperate for any but i understand this is difficult stuff for people to talk about um but people, a real person going, I can go to the supermarket without anxiety following me, or I can do it with anxiety and I get there just fine. You know, that's what I needed to hear. In terms of it being, you know, um, funny stuff, smaller stuff, bigger stuff. Um, I mean, it depends, doesn't it? Because there were moments when I was afraid of Jet's book, Where the Wild Things Are. I was scared of his pajama bottoms with monsters on them. Like at one point I thought teddy bears had cameras in their eyes. So actually it might feel like a little thing but the person that's living it at that moment um it could feel ginormous and and there sometimes the, the more insidious little ones can be the ones that go around your brain a little bit more that you know feel turn into an intrusive thought um so i think it was important to be as honest no matter how ridiculous those things are you know especially my illness you think a psychotic experience can, you know, lead you to delusions that you think there's red mist coming outside that nobody else can see or you're, that someone's trying to give you messages through the TV. You need to feel like you can say that to anybody and you're going to be met with an understanding and a, an empathy. So it was important to be as honest um, as I can. Streatham still scares me, though. I don't know why I tried to pretend it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair enough. It's fair enough. <laughs> Um, and like it, I think in addition to the honesty in the book is also the kind of educational layer to that. And it's purely through, I, I imagine you sharing your experience, but personally, I kind of, you know, definitely have a much better understanding of the differences in maternal mental health and postnatal depression and postpartum psychosis specifically. So those two illnesses were two that you were kind of diagnosed with and you called out with having feelings of, of having um, of having them. Um, could you kind of share a bit more in terms of the differences and the challenges that you had to kind of endure during that kind of pre-diagnosis phase in particular? Sure, I think diagnosis is a really difficult part in um, in all mental illness, but particularly maternal mental illness, because you've also got the, you know, first of all, the baby there, which is 
an immediate alarm bells going, you know, this baby needs practical care. It, and you've got the external pressures, which are actually really corrosive going, um, is my baby, my golden hour with my baby? Are we doing enough skin to skin? Are we looking in each other's eyes enough? Are we feeling that? So that's all going on. When you've, there's obviously the baby blues, which can come on the first sort of, um, from birth to the next 10 days where you might feel emotional and um, sensitive or irritable or just not like yourself. So there's that. And then there's postnatal depression, which can be an extension of that. It can go on for a longer amount of time, years in some cases. So my illness is quite hard to diagnose postnatal, postpartum psychosis because it can be built on postnatal depression, but it is different from postnatal depression. And what is so scary about it is it can be mi mistaken for baby blues in that early time because it comes on so quick. I've met women that um, have had perinatal psychosis or women that have had the psychosis psychotic episode during labor. Plus then on top of that, you've got the physical symptoms of what you've experienced during labor. So in my case, an emergency cesarean, medication, hormones. And I, for me, I felt and sleep deprivation, which some women don't sleep and don't manage to sleep in those early days before a labor anyway, because you're nervous, you're anxious, you're up and down, or you're, you're uncomfortable. But I feel like there wasn't really a moment where my body and my brain shook hands with each other and went, okay, um, you're handing yourself over to medicine now. You know, this is going to be complete um, intervention. You're having an emergency cesarean. I'd only ever broken my wrist before. That's the only time I'd have been to hospital when I was a kid from tripping over. So then suddenly being cut open and all of this stuff, and then a baby being slammed on my chest. Um, if I'd had surgery for any other reason, I would really take care of myself afterwards, you know, and um, you can't. You're straight away. There's no rest. Um, plus my baby, because he was born underway, um, he wants to feed for 24 hours. I'm not saying this to be a hero or anything, but I, I caught so, sight of my um, feeding notes once in the ward and I'd fed for 18 hours straight with a five minute break back on to do another five hours or something like that. And I was just like, this isn't physically possible, you know. And when you're in the ward, of course, again, the nurses, midwives are doing their best, but you can't switch off. You're in a shared space with many other parents and families that are doing their best to find rest babies are screaming their heads off at different times it's like a carousel of hell a lot of people are going through trauma uh, we had a couple opposite where they had twins and they've lost one of the twins um and they don't allow you to sleep with the baby on your chest but my baby would not be put down for a single second so how can this be described as the most rewarding time in your life now is mm. a lot more rewarding talking to you is a better day of my life than what that was because that was pure panic and hell I, and I'm not surprised when I look back that I got so unwell. And um, uh, I've heard you kind of uh, talk about oxygen masking and essentially you know so much of what you were being told is breastfeeding is, is critical you've got to get this nailed like we need to do this so th it's the opposite to oxygen mask masking where you know when you're on a plane you're told Put the oxygen mask on yourself first, and then your child. Um, do you, like what are your thoughts on that now? Um, in terms totally. of how much priority was put on you versus um, Jet? That is so interesting. I didn't think about that physical opposite of that. So I talk about oxygen masking now with recovery, with hindsight, which is I can't be a fit mum to my son if I'm not fit myself and you know the irony is the baby is always fine like the babies are built for survival that's their whole purpose is to stay alive and actually in those early days they don't care who gives them that milk they just want that milk and they just need to live and be cared for there was a million and one people around me caring for my baby and there was not a million and one people and that moment caring for me because I it wasn't about me and that the first title actually I haven't talked about this in an interview but yeah but the first title was actually going to be the broken oven because that's how I felt I felt like an oven that had spent all this time making the juiciest cake in the world and everyone came out to eat the cake and then I was just this old broken oven sitting on the corner of the road you know that had broken down and I'm not saying that my family treated me like that but that's how I felt in that time um the milk's a funny thing, this whole breast is best thing. Like, of course, it's, it's a joyous thing and it makes you feel so proud in those moments you can do it, which I could do it for a bit for a bit of it. But I remember waking up one morning, I say waking up, tossing and turning in the bed, uh, trying to wait for sleep medication to hit, um, when my, my breast milk just completely dried up. And now this is so rare, like the only sign for your hormones to give up like that means that 
it's grief it me it meant that i thought my baby had died um and so that is just such a low point to get to and how nobody intervened at this point is just wild because i was so deeply unwell at that point then that obviously feeds into your um your doubt as a parent you know i started thinking well if i was in the jungle if i was in the wild i wouldn't be able to feed my baby and because i didn't know that he'd already been starving inside me i just felt he was so angry at me like i'd already let him down like i'd already failed him before i had already begun like i'd started off on a bad foot and i had to catch up with him um so and these things stick to you and i, I think there is a lot of pressure on being a good mom it's like the ultimate thing we're expected to be this maternal goddess overnight that knows how to bake bread and peg up clothes properly and um it, it's actually quite toxic yeah um and you um you, you talk about the support of your your family and particularly your, your mum during this kind of phase um could you share a bit more about that i i fell in love with your mum through reading your, your book um, <laughs> and hugo um so it'd be brilliant just to, oh, to kind of share with the audience you. a bit more about them well what's interesting is my mum actually did have postnatal depression with my youngest brother so i'm the oldest and um, I actually remember a huge, well, I, I don't, I remember not remembering. So I have a huge ch chunk of my life from about seven onward where I don't remember my mum being around. I remember her in bed in a darkened room, very much like we see that stereotype sort of thing on TV of what a postnatal depressed person looks like. And um, I had no idea that my mum was suffering as bad as what she um, had done so when I went to the, uh, when I fell pregnant I did say to the midwife my mum suffered with really bad postnatal depression um, and for two years she suffered with that and missed out on a lot you know because of it um, so when it came to me she was telling me quite early on I think you're you've got postnatal depression but this is why my illness again is so slippery and so hard to diagnose because it falls across some categories but it just goes to that next other level to crisis point um so yeah my mom basically well first one mom is a massive pokemon fan and is a big gamer so i she was sort of he it was perfect for her with a newborn really because she just sort of sat in the corner pokemoning away catching a pikachu in the park um and looking after him but my house very quickly sort of became like glastonbury festival you know everyone was camped out looking after jet but i didn't realize also on suicide watch for me because that's how bad it got i mean i couldn't even go for a wee or change my pad without my sister high kicking the door down like some sort of frenzied spice girl um you know but everybody was there um and they kept telling me to get to get the help I needed. But you know, the, uh, such a horrible part of the illness is that you lose trust in everybody around you that loves you. So it's that horrible, sick thing where you know you need the medication, you know the people are telling you to take the medication, for example, are saying the right things, but you believe they're only giving you the medication to make you sicker. And so the circle goes around and around. It's very hard and very scary losing all your trust in everybody around you. And that's why I always say whenever people say, oh, mental illness, you know, is scary. It's like nobody is more scared than the person who is suffering. Mm. Yeah, very good point. And um, the, I think it's probably worth for the, for the people watching to kind of realize the how rare uh, postpartum psychosis in particular is. So I think the NHS now say it's like one in 500 um, mums will kind of suffer from this um you've described it as i want to get this right describe i mean it purely kind of bad luck first and foremost um and that's how doctors will kind of describe it too but it's essentially like kind of crossing the road on a normal day and getting hit by a speeding car like it, it can literally be anyone um could you kind of expand a bit more on just you know that randomness to it i suppose Sure, yeah. Oh, but also, I forgot one thing I wanted to say about my mum, actually, which I've never given her enough credit for, is there was one night where she had to lie in bed with me. This was the night before I was hospitalised, just going back because I just owe her a thank you for this, where she literally had to physically, with her whole body, hold me for 10 hours in the night so I didn't do something to myself. And I just can't imagine doing that to my own son now, like what power and strength that must have taken from her. And I know even to this day, she still, she hasn't read the book. She says, I don't need to read the book because I had to live it. So, um, and I remember her saying she couldn't love my grand, my her grandson, my son properly until she loved me because she said in that moment, the real baby in the room was you. And so when people think psycho psychosis is so scary, yes, it is scary, but actually, I was a child to her, I was a baby in that moment. 
Um, so, okay, what are we talking about? Right, so I had, after the illness, I, uh, when I felt the courage, like I could, I went back to the doctors and requested all my notes because I was going to the GP every day. This is quite important, I think, because I, um, because I think I write for my job. Look, I'm no brainiac, but I had, um, I feel like I did a pretty good job of describing, um, probably in a really annoying political way, um, my symptoms so I was explaining I can hear ambulance sirens and I feel like they're all for me or you know I just feel like the bear's looking at me funny I, I wasn't luckily I did have experience shame of course I did but shame wasn't my overriding uh, symptom I felt like I could still explain myself anyway I requested the notes and they were so I mean there were so many of them I'd gone back and forwards this is in the three weeks after Jet was born to being hospitalized a lot and um and I could request a further referral to speak to Dr. Ian Jones, who is a, a GP, I um, know oh he's a leading psychiatrist, sorry, uh, I got a GP's note. He's a leading psychiatrist in bipolar disorder and postpartum psychosis at Cardiff University and had all these questions and all of them were, you know, because when you've experienced a psychotic episode, you then sort of do this really horrible breaking of your whole entire life and you think what led me to this moment was psychosis in me like a kind of arctic you know an egg in the arctic like waiting to pop open and there it happened um was this because I couldn't look after my plants when I was smaller I was a bit mean to my hamster vanilla by putting him in the drawer for 20 seconds when I was a kid was I a bit horrible to a friend at school all of these things you you berate yourself with a bit like having um, anxiety when you're hung over and you think of all the bad things you've ever done times a million. So I had a lot of questions to ask him and an hour with him. Um, this is before the pandemic and it was over Zoom. And then um, I just sort of said, you know, why me? And he just said, it just wasn't your day. That's it. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, just see it like being hit by a car. It just wasn't your day. And that helped me so much because it was, it reminded me how, uh, immune, how unimmune any, all of us are to this. None of us are immune. Mental illness doesn't discriminate at all. It comes for, it doesn't care if you've got money, if you haven't, if you're good looking, if you're not, it doesn't care. It doesn't care what your job is nothing like that and that actually in a way was quite liberating because and, and has actually helped me so much with processing this every time every bus stop I walk past every time I'm in the supermarket you know I remind myself we are all a part of this and it, it I wasn't just singled out you know and that has really helped me deal with the blame and the shame um, and the guilt, you know, I live alongside it and I'm proud to have survived it. And I'm proud to have experienced it in my thirties because I feel like I can move forward my life knowing that other stuff exists. Yeah, and you should definitely be proud for having written this book <laughs> and, and shared it with the world. Oh, so, um, thank you. Um, just, uh, th th there was um, um, a, a few kind of brave references you make to kind of experiencing suicidal thoughts, uh, which, again you know very brave of you to be sharing um and i think you kind of point out that you know you're trying to battle the misunderstandings about suicide and suicidal thoughts so you talk about you know suicidal thoughts being a heart attack of the brain i, I never heard that it kind of explained in that way which really kind of helps understand it a bit more particularly from a thoughts perspective um and it being a, a symptom of your illness um so like what what are your kind of thoughts on the misconception of those sorts of thoughts and how people can support loved ones who are going through such kind of experiences. Oh, that's so nice. And the fact you've even asked that, because I think many of the interviews I do, people don't always want to ask about that, which is a shame because it only actually does the opposite of what we're trying to do by having this conversation in the first place. And it still seems the bit of the conversation that people to be, are too afraid to touch because it feels so heavy and that in itself then only inflames the whole thing so thank you for asking the question um first of all everybody is different so I can't speak for everybody only my own um situation and experience um but um yeah, I was suicidal more than once and a, a, a lot in my psychosis. I guess having, when I, I experienced psychosis, it was a bit like having a Rubik's cube where you have to try and get all the colors on one square. And sometimes I'd be like, I've got it. This is a whole wall of green. Ow, there's just one red block. And then I'd move it all again and my whole 
narrative would shift and change my delusions my conspiracies everything would go with it and I'd and, and have a whole new story and a meaning for everything um and all of them it felt like do you remember those quizzes when you're a kid and it's like which Backstreet Boy are you gonna marry and it'd be like this <laughs> do you do this do you do that do you do that and it seemed to like all point to suicide every single angle was like you could do you know you could put Jet up for adoption you could run away you could start a new life but you wouldn't be able to live with that or you could do that you just everything that I've never felt so trapped in my life so there was that going on but also after a psychotic episode it's quite normal to fall into a depression and it felt a little bit like no one was making me deliberately explicitly feel like this but I almost felt like come on chop chop you've done your hospital stint now get back to it you know as if I had been on a snorkeling trip in the Maldives I was like no no I've, I've been in a hospital but that was you know that depression going alongside that how people live alongside this is just absolute praise but um how I can describe it is being inside a burning building and I think if you were at the top of a burning building and you couldn't get out you might try and jump um not only because you were scared of your what what that might look like burning inside a building but you might think there was another chance of survival the pain is unbelievable and the fact that it's invisible only makes it worse because nobody can see what you're what you're feeling or experiencing just to be completely frank, I would also have been one of those people that might have said in the past, you know, uh, suicidal is selfish or suicidal is cowardly. Having suicidal thoughts myself, you know, um, experiencing them, there's nothing selfish about it really um, from, from my perspective, from what I was going through. I believe that the whole world would have been better off without me and my son, I did not want him to know me as poorly as I was, was at that time and that I would never get back to myself. And also oh, the strength that it would have taken me to have done that. You know, when I think back, I was on the edge, but there was such distance, the steps to take that to get to that point. I, I think we've spoken about this, but you know, having to physically get Hugo to like hide pills from me, hide all the knives in the house, you know, that trust from of lack of trust in yourself is so frightening. Um, what is the biggest shock is once you come through it and you talk about it and you say you were struggling, how many people say that they struggled as well? How many people are not shocked and surprised and everybody has had some sort of touch with it, either themselves or with somebody close or known somebody that has been and that there has to be more normalization around this this topic because it's become this you know I can't even type the word spaghetti in my phone now without autocorrect being like suicide and I'm like oh god no not you again if we talk about these these words they do just become normal to us and we can use them in our vocabulary and they won't scare us as much yeah very good point very good point um you have a section kind of at the end of the book called how to help a new mum so what would be your advice for, to kind of family and friends to ensure that mum gets the right support during birth but kind of critically post post birth oh that's so good well um first of all i try and say like if you want to help don't take the baby away from the mum you know if you really want to help make a shepherd's pie hoover up you know go to the shops make tea um don't tell mum how she should be feeling what she should be doing not just mum parents anybody with a with a baby um but i think check in you know there's ways without going how are you really patronizing how are things you know make and i i found like people that told me how difficult they found it that they were the people that i'd gravitate towards the most it was the people that said call me at any time four in the morning in the middle of the night that's absolutely fine i would say to anyone that's concerned you know i would say treat it like unattended luggage at a station you know where it could be it could be nothing but it could be something so I always say treat it suspicious if you are worried the amount of messages I get saying my friend's acting strange so as a symptom of um postpartum psychosis postnatal depression could quite simply be acting out of character acting strangely that doesn't have to be in a negative way that could be acting overly happy or you're euphoric um you know, not concentrating, not keeping up the conversation, not sleeping, even when you should be so tired, you know, and the baby sleeping, not sleeping, um, trying to isolate or withdraw, all of these things can be symptoms. So yeah, I think it's kind of cool to be on the postpartum police patrol and just check in and without patronizing, not giving unsolicited advice and going, oh, I gave birth to my 900 children in a cornfield and bit through the umbilical cords of my teeth. Everybody is different. You're not a failure if you've had to have help or, intervention somehow or if you use formula yeah and you mentioned earlier in this conversation about um you know 
symptoms being dismissed as baby blues. I think one of the symptoms um, that I was personally kind of keen to ensure we kind of discuss was, and there's a sentence in your book, which I kind of just keep like playing over and over my head. So you talk Mm -hmm. about um, you didn't get ill because you couldn't sleep, but rather you couldn't sleep because you were ill. So that, you know, just sleeplessness being a kind of really critical symptom. And as you say, it may not be for everyone, but something to kind of look out for is, are there kind of key ones like that that you specifically look out for or, um, yeah. I really like that you said that one because um, I remember a few, nobody meaning to be cruel or anything, but go, oh, just be kind to yourself, you know, just get a delivery, watch Netflix and sleep when the baby sleeps. Anyone that's experienced anything like this, you can't just sleep when the baby sleeps. So I was thinking, I'd be able to sleep. I fell asleep standing up at a Bjork concert. Banks, I can sleep. Well, I've done 31 years of sleeping. Suddenly, I literally couldn't. The strongest of medication was not even touching the sides. This was, I didn't get unwell because I couldn't sleep. Otherwise, people would be running around with psychosis all over the place. You know, it's a symptom of the illness. But it's one of those, I can't remember the exact phrasing for it I'm um but it is one of those symptoms that it feeds into itself so the illness does it but then the lack of also feeds into it it's very knotty and confusing that one's extremely is something to um worry out for but the problem is many of the symptoms are invisible you know you can't hear racing thoughts you can't hear dread you can't hear um confusion paranoia these things are And and because we're scared to say them, especially around that heightened time of having a new baby where the expectation is this should be the happiest time of your life. You should be glowing. This is so rewarding. You feel even more like you can't say it. And I think especially if you've been hospitalized or you already feel in debt, you know, I was separated from jets. So I felt like I had a lot of catching up to do. And then depression has this nasty way of making you feel like you've used up all your coins you know your tokens you're never going to get them back so you feel like you're groveling the entire time um and um yeah I think I think it's okay to be that alert friend and even if that means being cruel to be kind you know checking in on somebody as a friend that friend will thank you later you know um yeah very very good point um you you talk about after leaving the psychiatric ward um the ongoing struggles that you have obviously you're not going to leave and just be fully kind of healed um, and you talk about books specifically kind of being a, a healer for you um, yeah. so hearing and reading about other people and, and their kind of depressions and psychosis so what, what would you kind of recommend others suffering from from the same or um, how, how they could better kind of overcome their challenges well, first of all, I don't want anyone to think that I was there in psychosis and deep depression reading. Oh my goodness, you can't even close your eyes. Like you can't even get a fork of food to your mouth when you're going through it. So don't worry, I wasn't there writing a novel and sitting on a stack of books, earning the bread. Um, so when this is this has happened very slowly and my all my pleasures were taken away from me. I honestly, when I was unwell, if you stood me in a shop and said, what flavor, what chocolate do you want? I would have gone, I don't know what Laura likes. I don't know what Laura thinks. That's how bad it had got. Um, But when I started recovering bit by bit, I began reading now a really nice book that helped me is by Dr. Claire Weeks called Self-Help for Your Nerves. This is quite an intense book. It's um, Claire Weeks is very stoic and she speaks, it was the first book I'd read where it wasn't you know, preachy and self-helpy. It's very stern and I kind of needed that kind of talking to. I needed somebody that on, you know, page two was there talking about suicidal thoughts and because I I didn't want it to be dressed up felt in this like big, you know, end chapter about the big stuff I was feeling. I wanted it to be normalized. And she sits with you and she anyway, she's got a beautiful technique about floating, which basically means when you're going through something hard, we're sort of educated to fight it, you know, whether so-and-so lost their battle with cancer or was fighting depression, uh, fighting off a bug. And that very word in us stirs up the words that actually cause more adrenaline and anger or resentment towards the illness itself, because you do have all those feelings, or why should I even be feeling like this, or self-pity or sadness? Whereas you also don't want to retreat because that makes you feel like a mug, like you're a victim. So you don't want to flee either. So she talks about floating. So if you can't sleep, you know, try floating to sleep. If you can't walk to work, you know, can't get to work, float to work, you know, float the words out of your mouth, float, you know, 
onto the next page, float your baby into your arms, float him to the buggy. Using that mantra, I mean, I had float written all over my house for so long. And I said it to a friend actually, and she said, I've been trying the floating technique. And um, she said, I feel like I didn't realize, but I was a like exhausted firefighter with no water left in my hose that was just panting on the side because I've been trying to fight. And when you float, I mean, how Claire Weeks did it, actually it was with somebody with social anxiety who couldn't even, who couldn't go into shops. She said, don't, you know, march up to the counter, float through the door, float, to, you know, talk to the person behind the counter. And I was just like, this is such an amazing technique and it's helped me so much. So that book, um, but any lived account, anything, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be the same illness. That's what you realize when you've gone through this, that this is not just for, you know, this is not about just maternal mental illness. This is or mental illness or anything difficult. I would read stories on grief, on addiction, um, recovery, any any person. And you realize pretty much that um, everybody has or will or is going through something difficult or we're all just doing our best. Yeah, um, yeah, very good point. And, and just in terms of specifically within uh, maternal mental health, like just the, the variance in experiences, um, you know, in preparation for today, just kind of having conversations and, and reading more and more, you know, there's people that suffer from maternal mental health because they are going back to work and need to stop breastfeeding, for example, or even miscarriage, yeah. not even getting to the yeah. point of, of having the baby. Yeah. So just curious before I, we then shift to questions from others, um, if you could just share a bit more about that, please. I'm so glad you said that. And also, JT, because I know you're not going to say this yourself, but your research for this has been amazing. <laughs> You've been so brilliant to work with. I, honestly, it's been remarkable working with you and um, how much you've dug really deep and it's just amazing. So thank you. Um, so yeah, my illness in particular or any maternal mental illness, there is still little known about it. So it can completely come out of the blue. You can have a traumatic labor, chaotic labor and be completely healthy the other side of it and not feeling any negative feelings. You could have a healthy labor and go on to have my illness. So that really has nothing to do with it. Um, it's 50% more chance of getting an illness like mine if you suffer already from schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or personality disorder of any kind, or if it's in your um, genes. So, but again, with me, I had nothing like this that I should have been aware of. Um, there's also 50% chance that I could get it again. So shut down for business now mate that's it never again um and there's also 50 percent chance that i could i'm more likely to go on to have more um either bipolar or more psychotic episodes in the future but i have been told that i don't how i haven't been diagnosed with bipolar so um yeah it's a complete mystery really with this and there's lots of hard work going into it so action on postpartum psychosis which i'm now proudly and bizarrely an ambassador for you know this illness wasn't even in my brain I didn't even know it existed three years ago and then I remember the first time I saw a pamphlet and I thought oh I haven't just invented this but I did think that I was like oh they've just made this little illness for me to get me to make me leave them alone and it is real um and many women are surviving it yeah um yeah and uh I, like you say I think having these conversations and, and realizing yourself that there are others suffering this sadly and it, it is unfortunately kind of more uh common than, than we think but at the same time people are aware of it and are doing as much as they can to kind of oh but you know what problems, yeah. it's a hundred percent treatable it's completely treatable and that is the really good news it's a massive illness and it turns your life upside down but it's a hundred percent treatable yeah great that's that's great to hear um, so just shifting to questions, I believe we have one. Um, so it's going to pop up on the screen as long as everything works. Perfect. So uh, Lauren LeBeuf has asked, for those of us who are not yet mothers but hope to be, do you have any advice or words of wisdom, something you wish someone had told you? Um, that's so interesting because looking back, yes, so much. But, um, yeah, I think just to know... Uh, well, first of all, not to underestimate how important sleep is. It's not a case of, oh, just, oh, sleep when the baby is, you know, um, if you take medication, if you have to uh, get somebody in, if you have to, like, make a parent or a family member stay over, if you have to get the sleep. And that really is the oxygen masking. Put yourself forward even in those early days. But the most, most, most important thing, and this is not just for having a baby, this is just in general, ask for help. You know, that is not 
I think I think when you become a mum, you almost think you're going to be born with this box of knowledge inside you. You're going to know all the answers to everything because you're the mum. But actually, no, like I really badly needed my own mum, but help from many people in that time. Don't let your pride get in the way. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. I think ask for help. That's the best mum move you could possibly do. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, and then uh, I suppose we've kind of spoken about the support that friends and family can have, but do you do you feel there's, um, like if there was one thing that you could uh, say to someone who is the support person, so a partner of a, a pregnant um, woman or someone who's just a new mum, like what is that one thing that you would kind of ensure that they were doing? To support? For support, yeah um just checking in and it's quite as simple as that uh checking in all the time and asking how you're actually feeling and it's not a practical physical thing you know it's all about the routine of the baby and and this kind of clockwork machine remember you're dealing with humans here and I think trust the people around you because they know you I think Hugo my partner who was just amazing when I was ill he said if he's got one bit of advice for anybody he would say just keep talking just talk all the time because even if this is you know the illness doesn't always show itself even to the person that is suffering with it so it could be thinking you know you could have a partner there and you might be thinking they're speaking very fast or they're speaking a little bit odd it doesn't help for me because I'm always speaking fast but they're speaking a little bit fast or speaking a bit odd or they're doing things in an unusual way just keep an eye on it and don't even think twice about asking for help if you're not letting anybody down or betraying your partner for asking if you're unsure. Cool. Um, and just coming to the end, I had kind of one final question and, and that's just uh, um, the bonds you now have with Jet. How, how's that relationship going? Oh my God, like this guy, he got given a free bee perfume sample in the um, supermarket the other day and now everything is, mom, look at my perfume, I'm so romantic. <laughs> and um, I would say our like, bond is, we're completely, like the three of us, we're happy. I, I always thought coming from a big family, the same with Hugo, that we'd have loads of kids. That's what I imagined. And being a children's writer almost made me think, oh goodness, I'm a children's writer that had a child and couldn't even look after their own baby. It's so weird, you know, I, it made me feel more ill. Um, and now, you know what, I'm like, I'm just so, I'm good. Like as rewarding as it is having Jet, there's been nothing more rewarding than surviving this mental illness and learning about the other side of this because I just feel qualified in that way now that I've earned my right to stand here and be like, I'm his mom and it's taken me a lot to get here, you know? And when I stand in the cube with the other moms at the school, I'm like, we've all been through so much, you know? Parents go through so much to um, bring their child to this earth and it takes a lot. Um, but yeah, no, he's, yeah, he's, oh, I, uh, you know, He's, I never thought he would forgive me for what we he, we went through. That's how I felt. And um, yeah, the forgiveness is there. Perfect. What a great way to wrap up. Um, <laughs> so, Laura, um, as I said at the beginning, so what have I done is, you know, it's out now and we put a link in the video description. So for those watching, please do check it out. It, it truly is an amazing story to read and, and one that is... Uh, brave and also kind of educational, informative and um, guaranteed to kind of help those that read it. Massive, massive thank you to you, Laura, um, both oh, for your you time too, today, for, for the book and the brave words, um, and also for whatever to, to come next for you. So uh, um, thank you. And um, that's a wrap thank for today. You, thank you, everyone watching. Um, and goodbye, everyone. Take care.